So we've got this wonderful experiment we do at the Vatican Observatory with the meteorites. Um, <clears throat> I, I have this collection of meteorites that was donated by a French uh, nobleman, the Marquis de Maua. It's spelled R-O-Y, but I've you know, watched enough hockey to know that R-O-Y is pronounced wa. <clears throat> and when I arrived in 1993, I discovered that there were these meteorites and there was no curator which was marvelous because the trouble with most meteorite collections is that the curator won't let you touch the meteorites. And if you want to do science, you have to beg and promise. And <clears throat> the Natural History Museum of London calls their curator, not a curator, but the keeper of the meteorites. <clears throat> Suddenly, I was my own curator, and I could do whatever I wanted with them. <clears throat> and I thought of all sorts of, of, I had done theoretical work. I'd been a theorist for many years. And finally, I could do some experiments. And the world between theorists and experimentalists is, well, because I was a theorist, I didn't know that there were experiments you couldn't do. So I figured out ways to do them. One of the measurements I do is, is heat capacity. How much heat does it take to raise the temperature of a meteorite one degree? How much heat does it take to give off when it drops by one degree? How do you measure that? It turns out there are million dollar machines. A, a colleague of mine at Boston College has one of these, Father Sayo Peel. But you've got to carve up the meteorites to use the million dollar machines, and even I won't let me do that. <clears throat> but imagine, if you will, a scale connected to a computer, recording the weight on the scale every second. You put a doer on the scale. What's a doer? It's um, a thermos bottle. My doer has the word thermos written on the side because I bought it at Target for $20. <clears throat> you fill it with liquid nitrogen. And the light, liquid nitrogen is slowly evaporating away, and so the weight goes down, pump, 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 in a nice linear fashion. And then you take your meteorite and you drop it in the liquid nitrogen. And it boils like mad because the liquid nitrogen is at you know, 200 degrees below zero, and the meteorite is at room temperature. <clears throat> until the meteorite drops down to liquid nitrogen temperature, which is uh, 77 Kelvin. And <clears throat> meanwhile, of course, you drop the meteorite in. The weight goes up by the weight of the meteorite. After it's boiled away, it goes down to bump, a bump, a bump where it was before. And you can see how much nitrogen got boiled away. And you know how much heat it takes to boil away a gram of nitrogen. And so you know how much heat came out of the rock. And you know how many degrees it fell, so you know the heat capacity. And this is really cool. Because, because, why would anybody do this experiment? <clears throat> and I don't mean that in just the, 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 the global sense. Oh, I can. I can come up with excuses. I can say that this number is useful for people making models of asteroids. Why would anybody want to make a model of an asteroid? Well, you know, one of these asteroids might be coming and ending life on Earth, and if you know the heat capacity, you can paint it black on one side, and you know how long you have to have it in the sun before it moves because it irradiates heat one way and not the other way. And Yeah, right. <laughs> when, I go to my, when I wake up on a Thursday morning, do I say to myself, I've got to get to the laboratory today and measure one more heat capacity because, oh my gosh, if we don't have these numbers, then in the year 2047, we're all going to die. That's not what does. That's not what happens. This was a real issue to me when I was a postdoctoral fellow. Um, you know, I was at, at, at MIT. I was in the big leagues. I was a utility infielder, but I was in the big leagues. <clears throat> And I'd wake up on a Tuesday morning and say, oh, it's 9 o'clock. Well, I don't want to go into work right now because it's the rush hour. And you know, they don't really care when I show up since nobody, I'm not punching a time clock. So I'll wait till 10 o'clock. Meanwhile, I'm doing the laundry. And well, I can't really, you know. I, <clears throat> and the place really could use a cleaning. You know, it's lunchtime now. What's the point of going in for lunch? Because I just have to buy lunch. I could eat, make a sandwich here. Do you know movies at 1 o'clock are half the price of movies at 5? <clears throat> and OK, I've just seen that movie again, and now it's 5 o'clock. What's the point? Of Why do you go in to do the work? 
what is it that motivates you to be a scientist in the big sense? Why do people pay you to do science? And what is it that motivates you to do science in the personal sense? Why do I do it today? These are fundamental questions, I think, of any vocation, but they certainly are true of a scientist because the progress you make in your research is so painstakingly slow that by the end of the day, you wonder if you've done anything. You wonder if you've really accomplished anything. A sign of that is in our Jesuit community, there is a rush to see who gets to empty the dishwasher because at least then you feel like you've done something that day. <laughs> Why do we do science? A lot of it reminds me of why did I go to MIT? I went to MIT because my friend Mike was going there and because I had a big science fiction collection, but I stayed there because I felt like I was part of a community. Because science is this conversation you have with a community. When I arrived at the Vatican Observatory and I was given very strict instructions about the science I could do, the director looked at me in the eye and said, do good science. I didn't have to worry about grants. I didn't have to worry about sitting on committees. It didn't matter if it took 10 years to get the results. But the science I chose to do was the science that was of interest to people I liked who liked talking about the science to be part of a community. There are some corners of science where people are really nasty to each other. Life's too short to do that. There are too many other things to do. There are other reasons why you can get people to you know, support science in a bigger sense, but you need that community to make it happen. And as an example of why the community is important, why you know, what you're doing is important, um, about 20 years ago, I gave a talk at a colleague at College of Charleston, South Carolina, invited me down. I talked about the moons of Jupiter and the theoretical models and, and how I'd been making measurements that could improve the models. And a kid comes up afterwards and he goes, this is a great talk. I really like what you're doing. I want to be a geologist. Great. This is what you hope is going to happen, right? You're going to inspire people. He says, I want to be a geologist. What do I tell my mom? South Carolina, Bible Belt. If being a geologist means that your mom is going to be ashamed of you, you're not going to be a geologist. If being a geologist means that you have to explain full time that no, you're not, you haven't you know, sold your soul to the devil because you think the world is 4.5 billion years old. It isn't, by the way, it's 4.567 billion years old. <clears throat> if that's the social atmosphere that you're coming out of, it means that you're not going to do it. You're going to find other things you can do, other things that won't be so embarrassing to your family. Let me give you an example of really what I mean that I think we can all relate to. There are one billion people living in India, right? More people than in, in uh, North America and Europe combined. And there are a lot of mountains in India. You've probably heard of the Himalayas. A lot of snow there. How many Indians have won a medal in the Winter Olympics? The answer is zero. It's not because people in India aren't good athletes. You know, ask anybody who plays cricket. But there's not a culture of learning how to do downhill skiing. There's not a culture of moms who want their daughters to be figure skater champions. If you don't have a culture that thinks this is really cool, then it's going to be hard for you to do it. It's going to be hard for you to find somebody to teach you how to do it. It's going to be hard for you to find other people to compete against, to hone your skills, to make you good enough to compete on the national stage. And certainly you'll never be able to have a job teaching the next generation. Science is an activity of an entire community, just as sport is an activity of an entire community. And if we lose in our society the desire to support that work, then it's not going to happen. But why do we as individuals choose to do it? And why do we as individuals persevere in the field? You're not going to make a whole lot of money as a scientist. 
There's no power in being a scientist. You know, they say that information is power, or if that was true, then uh, the most powerful people you knew would be your librarian. <laughs> and certainly being a scientist doesn't get you girls. Didn't work for me. <clears throat> I think I can give you an example, though, of why we do science, why we have it. <clears throat> One year, I had a sabbatical year. Most professors who are, get a sabbatical year give up teaching and go off and do research for a year. Since my job is full-time research, I give up research for a year and I go off and teach, which is what I would join the Jesuits to do. Naturally, they had other ideas. I had a year at Fordham, and I was teaching the pre-med chemistry students, really bright students. And I was teaching them the introduction to electricity and magnetism, and one of the, the key points of this is Maxwell's equations. Now, you don't have to know what Maxwell's equations are, except that they're kind of complicated, but <clears throat> they're how electricity can be generated by changing magnetic fields and how magnetism can be uh, generated by currents of, of electric fields. And there's an equation that explains the relationship, and the equation is a differential equation. And if you do a derivative of this and a derivative of that, and you squeeze them all together, you eventually generate one equation to rule them all, <laughs> that the change of the change of the electric field in time is related via a constant with the change of the change of the electric field in space. I can see all the eyes glazing over. <laughs> but not so the kids sitting in the front row. Because I was doing all of this to build up to a whammo finish, and he already leapt to it. He looked at the equation and he went, oh my god, it's a wave. Because yeah, that's what the wave equation is. And Maxwell had worked out that the nature of electricity and magnetism meant that you can get waves of electricity, of electric field, and waves of magnetic field, and we, <clears throat> We can use these things. Uh, a fellow named Hertz said, well, if that's true, then I could just wave you know, some, some electrons up and down and get it, uh, you know, a, the needle flashing back and forth over there with nothing in between. And, and it worked. And the rate at which he waved them up and down, we now call the Hertz after him. There was a fellow named Marconi that said, if I had a really tall thing with wire going up and down, I could send this in every direction, every radius. The Italian word is radio. That's where that comes from. Tesla says we can use this to transmit power over long distances. Everything electronic in your pocket starts with Maxwell's equations. And the fact that, oh my God, it's a wave. And even Einstein's theory of relativity came out of the nature of these equations. It's a really exciting thing to see. I haven't had one of those oh my god moments the way that I'm sure Maxwell must have had. I've, I've had some small ones, nothing as big as that. Um, I've had moments when I can compare the data from this part of the meteorite measurement and that part of the meteorite measurement and see a correlation and I go, this is cool, you know, Dan Britt's really going to be thrilled because Dan Britt's my friend and I've got something cool to tell him. It's the joy that I experience in this tiny discovery and the joy I have in sharing it with people that makes me every day go back to the lab and hope that today's the day where suddenly I'm going to have enough data points that I can see a pattern, that I have a tiny insight <clears throat> into the way that the universe works, that, that I will have, <clears throat> when I was a kid, and uh, we had a cottage up in uh, Lake Huron, just south of Lexington. And it was a rainy day, and the, you know, the cottage had a little porch you could sit in so you get out of the rain, but you couldn't go out to play. And my mom came out and you know, shuffled a deck of cards. Um, yesterday was my mom's 96th birthday, by the way. <clears throat> yeah. and, and she shuffled the deck of cards and dealed them out, and at one point, I guess it was a moment when I had one of these little adult insights that you get when you're 10 and you can't, don't know quite what to do with them. Because she's a grown-up. She could win this game anytime she wants. Why is she playing with me? It's because she loves me. Ooh. You know, she couldn't just say, Guy, I love you because I'm a 10-year-old. I'm going to go, oh, Mom! <laughs> and I think of that when I'm in the lab. And I get some little insight 
into how the universe works. I've solved some little puzzle that, you know, is only interest of me and five other people. And I hear God chuckling in the background saying, isn't that cool? Let me show you the next one. <clears throat> but that doesn't really explain in a grander sense why we as a society supports, support science. I had that big question when I was at MIT and I'd lie in bed at three in the morning worrying about the five people who are gonna read the paper that I'm trying to write and wondering why am I knocking myself out worrying about the moons of Jupiter when there's people starving in the world? You know, I went to UAD High. They instilled one of those nasty consciences in me. <clears throat> Terrible thing they did. And I didn't have an answer. Why should anybody care about the moons of Jupiter when people are starving? And that's when I said, well, science is useless, I guess. Um, I want to do something useful with my life. I'm 30 years old. Oh, my gosh, I'm aged. I'm not a kid anymore. So I quit science, and I joined the Peace Corps, and I went off to do some good. Um, you know, Dave talked, uh, talked a little bit about that. I went off to, you know, dig ditches. You want me to dig ditches? I'll dig ditches. Uh, well, they said, you could be a high school teacher. I'll teach high school. <clears throat> They, they said, you're going to go to a school where there's no windows in the windows and no black on the blackboards. And I go, yeah, yeah, send me in. I'm going to do something worthwhile, finally. And by the end of training, they said, well, actually, you've got a doctorate. We're going to send you to the best high school in the country that in 1983 had a lab with computers in it for high school kids and a lab with lasers in it for high school kids. And I go, well, if this is what the country needs, okay. And after three months of that, I was at the University of Nairobi teaching graduate students astronomy, which I could have been doing back in Boston, you know? <clears throat> well, I, there was a logic to it. There was the only society that we know of that can regularly feed its people is a technologically sophisticated society. For all of the problems that technology has of alienation and pollution, we can all talk about that. Nonetheless, it feeds people on a regular basis. And I saw in my time in Peace Corps that, you know, people who live close to nature, there's a word for that. It's called starving. You want a whole society. You need a communication. You need a, a, a community to make this happen. To have a technologically sophisticated society, you've got to have an educated populace. For that, you have to have schools. For that, you have to have teachers. The kids I was teaching all had jobs waiting at the Kenya Science Teachers College, and eventually this would help starvation in Kenya, and that's not why they wanted to know astronomy. Because every weekend, I'd go up country with my other fellow Peace Corps volunteers who really were in the places with no windows in the windows, and I had a little telescope that I'd set up and everybody in the village would go look through the telescope. And they'd see the craters on the moon, and they'd go, wow. How many people have seen the craters of the moon through a telescope or binoculars? Yeah. Moons of Jupiter, wow. Rings of, how many people here have seen the rings of Saturn through a telescope? All right, how many of you have ever seen the rings of Saturn and not gone, oh, wow? Because <laughs> that's what human beings do. I had a very clever cat in those days, much better at being a cat than I ever could be. But my cat never wanted to look through the telescope. It was mostly interested in being fed. But human beings do not survive on bread alone. I read that someplace. It's literally true. If you're telling somebody, I'm sorry, you don't get to do astronomy because you were born in the wrong century or the wrong continent or the wrong gender or the wrong whatever, you're telling them, I'm sorry, you're not completely human. But that's a lie. But you do say to them, this astronomy, let's first of all look at the stars because they're amazing. And then let's look at the stars and talk about what we think and what people before us have thought and where we're hoping to learn things next. And you can become part of this conversation that makes us fully human. And it doesn't matter if you're African or American or Asian or whatever, because this is stuff we all do, because we all went to the moon. It wasn't just the astronauts. It was the guys who built the rocket, the guys who planned out the orbit, the people who did the calculations over the orbit, the people who fed them in the cafeteria so they could do the calculations, the people who built the roads that allowed them to carry the food to the cafeteria. We all went to the moon. 
We all can glory in what we have done. You may have heard recently about the discovery of gravitational waves, and this was done by a couple of really wonderful but complicated uh, experiments, one in, in uh, Baton Rouge, one in the state of Washington. There's a new one now in Italy. Story about the funding of these, talking about the political background. The head of the National Science Foundation and the head of this program were doing the rounds of senators trying to find out who's going to pay for this stuff. And they went to a particular senator from one of the southern states, Rock Ridge Republican, very conservative. And they're kind of wondering, you know, he can actually control this, but what are we going to say to convince him? They walk in there and the senator says, so of what possible commercial value is discovering gravitational waves? And the head from NSF is about to go into, you know, it's going to give us Teflon or whatever, the kind of crazy things they said the moon landing was going to do. The head of the program said there's absolutely no commercial value to discovering gravitational waves. And the senator said, well, if that's true, then private industry will never pay for it, so I guess the government has to. And they got the money. We do science for that oh my God moment. But we as a community and as a society do science for an equally big oh my God moment. Because it's that moment when we experience the joy that is the presence of God. When we experience the joy that reminds us that we are people who are oriented to more than just what's for lunch. Speaking of which, I hope you had a great lunch. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Brother Guy. We have just enough time for about two or three questions from the audience. Uh, Mary Alice. Mecky has a microphone in the middle of the room, so anybody have a question for Brother Guy? Raise your hand and she'll get you the mic. Here, okay. Brother Guy, could you please tell us a little bit about Pluto and how the satellites, the, the probe that went mm -hmm. by the summer before yeah. last changed your perspectives? Um, first of all about Pluto, when Pluto Pluto was a marvelous experience of theory and observation. I've mentioned before there's this tension between theory and observation. I was, I was in Rome once after one of these scientific meetings, and one of the guys over uh, beers was uh, complaining about terrorists. Terrorists never listen to you. Terrorists think they know everything. Terrorists are impossible to work with. And it was five minutes in before I realized he couldn't pronounce the TH. Well, it was theorists <laughs> who predicted that there should be a big planet perturbing Neptune. And they said, look here. And when you look there, they saw a little moving dot of light. And they said, well, that must be our big planet. In the 50 years after that discovery, they, they found out that, number one, Neptune really wasn't perturbed. It was just a mistake in calculating its orbit. And number two, every time they tried to measure the size of Pluto, it was smaller than they thought, and smaller than they thought, and smaller than they thought. Um, you know that the Earth's moon is significantly smaller than the Earth. Pluto is that much smaller than the Earth's moon. At which point you go, okay, it wasn't the thing we thought it was. But we've since discovered a whole class of objects that are all fascinating because as the probe says, Pluto itself is fascinating. And to insist that Pluto in order to have full dignity must be a planet is an example of uh, planetism. <laughs> <clears throat> Who's to say that only planets are worthy of having interesting things to say about them? Uh, you know, when Pluto thought it was a planet, all the other planets made fun of it because it had the wrong orbit and the wrong shape. And, but when it discovered it was a family of a whole new class of objects, it went from being an ugly duckling to a beautiful swan. And, and the dwarf planets themselves are phenomenally interesting objects. Just this week, we discovered that another one of these dwarf planets, Haumea, 
has not only a couple of little moons, it's got a ring. Isn't that cool? How does that happen? And why do we care? Well, because if we can explain that, we can explain how come the asteroids don't have rings, how are rings formed, maybe that tells us about how planets are formed, and it gives us that richer story to tell about how the solar system was put together, how the universe works. Thanks. Person with the mic is coming. Who wrote Maxwell's equations? Well, a guy named James Clark Maxwell, of course. No, Oliver Heaviside. Ah, from the version that we've got. Um, when, when I give tours at the Vatican Observatory, which we've got, you know, an outfit in Rome and an outfit in Tucson, and the outfit in Tucson runs the telescope, and the telescope is supported by your donations, but we're not supposed to say that today. <laughs> but if you want more of this conversation, I can say go to a place called the Catholic Astronomer. Anyway. A, a blog site, which is really a lot of fun. Um, I give tours and I try to explain that science is more than, astronomy is more than just looking through a telescope. You have to have a literature. You, um, when the Vatican moved its observatory from the wall of the Vatican to Castel Gandolfo, 1935, the Vatican libraries used this as an excuse to dump all of their modern science books and clear out their library. To them, modern is anything printed with a printing press. <laughs> so we have sitting on the shelves the complete run of the philosophical transactions going back to 1665, papers by Newton. You can just pull them off and go, yep, Matt Newton, he knew what he was doing. I pulled one at random to say, what if I ever wanted to look and open it up at random? It was 1665, or 1865, and it was Maxwell's equations. And the version that were on, you know, that's, I have on a t-shirt that says, and God said Maxwell's equations, and there was light. That's, that version isn't in there, but clearly the version that led to that is in there. The one thing I discovered, since you're a historian of science, you'll appreciate, the electric field is always referred to as the E field, E for electric, that makes sense. The magnetic field is always referred to as the B field because B stands for what? In Maxwell's original paper, he lists all the terms A, B, C, D, E, and the second one magnetic field happens to be term B. And that's held on to this day. Kind of curious, what do you think of the philosophical argument that curiosity is a moral virtue? Um, I'll put it in a different way since I've got you know, an old fashioned uh, catechism sort of point of view. Suppressing curiosity is a mortal sin. <laughs> it's, it is one of the things that makes us human, makes us more than eating machines. And yet, with everything, uh, it has to be done within limits. There are, there, it's not that there are things man was not meant to know, but there's a time and a place when you want to ask somebody a question you're curious about that maybe would be very rude to ask them. So not all curiosity unbounded is that way. It, it's, it reminds me, though, of the sense of the nature of the physical universe. Um, we get... Genesis questions all the time, and I'm going to fold this into where you, what you're talking about. When people read Genesis and they go, well, that's not the Big Bang Theory. We know the Big Bang Theory was invented by a Catholic priest, George Lemaitre. He was not a Jesuit. He hated being called a Jesuit. It is possible to be smart and not be a Jesuit. <laughs> <clears throat> but people worry about you know, the seven days of creation until you realize they were writing on contrary to a universe that the Babylonians believed in of the same you know, era, that the universe was random, it was a mistake, we weren't supposed to be here, and the only reason the universe exists is so that the city of Babylon can exist. And the writers of Genesis were saying, no, the universe is a deliberate action by a God who is outside of nature and supernatural, who does things in order, and the entire arc of Genesis chapter 1 leads to, not this is the way science works, because, you know, science changes. My, uh, my science books that I've written are all out of date. Throw them away. The Bible is not out of date. So if you're going to say the Bible is a science book, then you'd have to throw it away every five years. 
the arc of Genesis is that all of creation leads to the Sabbath. And what do we do on the Sabbath? We contemplate God. And how do we contemplate God? By, among other things, God, contemplating God's creation. Since the beginning of time, God has revealed himself in the things he made. So not only is science an act of worship, it's, to my mind, the point of why we exist, to come to know God. Maybe it will be through art. Maybe it would be through dance. Maybe it's through telling funny stories. Maybe it's through understanding how the atom works. But all of these are explorations of a universe that brings us closer to God, God the creator, the God who so loved the world that he sent his son, and the God, Jesus Christ, who in this universe embraced the universe and made it sacred. And that's why we do science. Everybody, have a great time. Do some experimenting on your desserts. Thanks for coming.